We're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. I pray that we are ready to meet the Lord. Amen. The Bible teaches us that each and every child of God ought to live their life every single day prepared to meet our God. I pray that we are considering that. I'm praying that we are understanding of that, and I'm praying that we take it serious. I believe that many Christians, or at least people that say they're Christians today, and I, I and again, I'm not saying that to say I doubt their salvation. Uh, only God and the individual knows. But many people today are not living like they really believe the Lord's coming back soon. We're living like we got another thousand years. But you know, even if the Lord doesn't come back today, and let's say He doesn't even come back for a thousand years, you and I both know we are not promised tomorrow. Life is but a vapor, appeareth for a little while, then vanisheth away. We could live 120 years on this earth, and the day we die, it will seem like nothing compared to eternity. Most of us are probably not going to make it to 120 years, amen? I look at my family lineage, and I, I see a lot of people that died early. Few that lived into their 80s or so, but many would be considered what we'd say died early. And so I look at that and I think, I might not have that long. I'm not as old as some, but I'm older than others. And uh, my wife let me know when I turned that 35 years old, and that was a few years back, that I was at the halfway point, amen. <laughs> we need to be ready. Because today might be the day that either the Lord steps out on the cloud with that trumpet sound. Or it might be the day that he just calls us individually home. We need to be ready to meet our God. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. The Lord did something he's never done in my life. I've heard other preachers talk about it, but he had never done this in my life, but this week he did. And that is, took me, who's, I, I like to sleep, amen, and woke me up very early, well before my alarm was supposed to go off. And would not let me go back to sleep. Had something in my heart. Led me to the word of God. And God started to speak to me. And I spent a time of rejoicing in the Lord. A time of just weeping and, and worshiping. And, and just basking in what God has done for us. And I'm praying that God helps me to be able to preach today. What he did to me that morning. And we might all enjoy the goodness of the Lord in these verses. 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to read the entire chapter. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, and when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machur, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker and the son of Emil from Lodabar. 
Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself. And said, What is thy servant? That thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. Then the king called to Ziba. Saul's servant said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have fruit, food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread alway at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, saith the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Father, we are so thankful today. I pray that, God, we would be full of that thankfulness. Just dwelling in the thought, Lord, of what you did for us. And what you continue to do for us. Father, I pray that today we would be a people of thanks. A people of worship. That God, we would not just be here to be here. And that God, we would not be here like bumps on a log. But God, that we would truly give you the worship you deserve. We thank you for the scriptures. And for what you're about to speak to us in the preaching. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. The story of Mephibosheth and David is one of the greatest stories of mercy and grace in the Old Testament. It is a great illustration to us of mercy and grace, but I think that we can get even more personally out of the story. I want us today to put on our imagination caps and as I paint a picture to help us to see a great truth today, I am asking God, I've been begging God for him to just settle in amongst us today and do a work in us that will change us today for his honor and glory. I want us to see, first of all, in our text, the people in the text. We see four in particular that the Bible, I want us to really focus on. First is David. You know, David, as he is thinking of this deed that he would like to do, and as Mephibosheth is brought forward, we find that David has every right to kill Mephibosheth. He is a threat to his throne. He is the heir of the previous king. And every right does David have to remove him. He had every opportunity to kill him. I mean, even, he, even after this deed here, if David's heart was not right, in 2 Samuel chapter one, uh, 21, he's got an opportunity to get rid of Mephibosheth. When the Gibeonites, uh, the Lord is cursing the land because of Saul's deeds to the Gibeonites. And the Gibeonites say, hey, we don't want any money. We don't want anybody else. Give us seven sons of Saul. He could have given Mephibosheth. He did give a Mephibosheth, but it was not this Mephibosheth. He gave him the son of Saul, not the son of Jonathan. He had every opportunity. But you know, one of the things that David is known for that I want us to focus in today, he is known as the shepherd king. 
the shepherd king. Keep that in memory. The second person that we recognize in this story is Mephibosheth. And of course, Mephibosheth is well known. Uh, when you think of the longer names of the Bible and the harder maybe to pronounce names of the Bible, Mephibosheth is a name that is on most Christians' lips. I mean, there's a song, at least one, written about Mephibosheth that, as I even say it, probably the song came to your mind. In fact, it was that song that God used that morning. To wake me up, it was immediately in my mind. It would not go away. I couldn't go back to sleep. It just kept drawing me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Mephibosheth is first recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4. After Saul and Jonathan have died and, and his nurse, he's uh, I think it's four or five years old. His nurse is running away because of fear of the enemy coming into the area. What they might do to the king's family. And, and she's running with him. And, and he falls and becomes lame. Notice that it is upon the death of his father that he became lame. Notice as well that he was living in the house of one maker. We will see more about him in a little bit, but this is the house he was living in. Now, I want us to understand as we get to looking at Maker here in a little bit, I believe that Maker probably was a good man, was probably kind and gentle. But we're going to see something, an illustration with him that will go against that. But I don't think we're doing this to harm the name of the man. We see two other men, just to say who these are, Jonathan and Saul. Both spoken of in these verses. Both well-known figures in the Bible. Jonathan was the friend of David. When Jonathan died, David proclaimed that his love for Jonathan and the love of Jonathan surpassed that of women. And of course, You'll have the world and those that are disgusted and, and, and twisted in mind will try to say that Jonathan and David were in a, in a sodomite relationship, but that is not so. That is wicked, and David would never have been a man after God's own heart if that was so. It was a friendship that the bonds of that friendship uh, were so great that it surpassed even uh, uh, the, the love uh, of a woman and a man. Because the love often of a woman and a man is a lot physical. Whereas the love of these two went well beyond any kind of physical. We see the people. We see the places that are mentioned here. One not necessarily mentioned but is understood and we'll see why in a moment. But we see Lodabar. Lodabar, the place where Mephibosheth is dwelling in the house of Maker. The name Lodabar means not a pasture. Not a pasture. What does that mean? It's a place of want. It's a place that doesn't produce much. It's a place that is barren and dry. It is a place that Really, you probably don't want to be. We see the second place that is not mentioned but is understood is the place of Ephraim. Why is this understood? Well, Ephraim is the homeland of the Benjamites. Saul was a Benjamite. This was the home place of Saul, the home place of Jonathan. But you know... Mephibosheth probably never experienced it as his home place. They lived outside of that probably when he was born. The name of Ephraim means double fruit. A much different meaning than not a pasture. Ephraim was a place of plenty. Ephraim was a place that, that the streams were running, the trees were growing, the crops were abounding, the sheep were jumping around and, and being fro frolicky and, 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 and fruitful. Amen? It was a place of much. Quite different from where 
we find Mephibosheth. The third place we find mentioned specifically in verse 13, Jerusalem. The name Jerusalem exactly means teaching of peace. Teaching of peace. But it is also known as the city of peace. The city of peace or even the city of God. It is the place where David conquered to set up his throne as the one chosen of God, given the promise that through him would be an eternal throne. We see the places. We see thirdly the proposal. In verse 1, David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul? For what purpose I can destroy those who might uh, try to go against me and try to take my throne? No, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. We see in this proposal kindness. Kindness. Oh, not many proposals these days of kindness. Amen. As we look about us, there's a lot of proposals that, that have to do with selfishness and other things, but very little kindness in proposals today. We see in verse 5, Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Emil, from Lodabar. We see the swiftness of the proposal. You know, as soon as David found out that there was one of the house of Saul, one that, that he could show that kindness to, David immediately sent an envoy after him. He didn't wait and say, well, let me go check it out and see if he's worthy. He didn't say, well, let me send some, some spies into the land and we'll, we'll spy on him and we'll see what kind of person it is and see if he's living up to my expectations. He just swiftly sent somebody to get him. In verse 7, we see David said unto him, Mephibosheth, fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. We see a restoration in the proposal. Of course, Mephibosheth, as he comes, he, he bows before him and falls on his face and, and does obeisance. And why? Because he's full of fear right now. Why does the man that has the throne that my father was supposed to be the heir of, why is he sending for me? There's only one thought that can be playing in the mind of Mephibosheth. It's death. It's death. I am a threat to this man. But oh... Instead of death, there's restoration given. Verse 11, Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's son. We see a position in this proposal. A position as one of of the king's sons. This proposal sounds better every time I read it. We look then at verse 8 and we see a profession being made. Mephibosheth is being spoken of and he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? What a profession. Confession, another word for it. To understand this man is the rightful king. Therefore, I am nothing but a dead dog. Because of my lineage, I, I have a I have a frame of mind and I have a I have maybe even a desire in my heart to usurp his kingdom to usurp his throne to usurp his authority but I recognize that you King David you are the rightful king God has given you your throne and I am but a dead dog I am worthless I am no good 
it would be better that I were dead. We see in this profession that Mephibosheth chose to bow. And this is very important because, you know, not all of the house of Saul chose to bow. If you look with me at 2 Samuel chapter 16, we see another one of the house of Saul. Not necessarily a son, not necessarily one that would have been heir, but one of the house of Saul. He was maybe an uncle, maybe a cousin, maybe a nephew. But this man, Shimei, he chose to curse David. In chapter 16, verse 5 through 8, And when King David came to Behurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David, and on all the servants of King David, and all the people, and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because because thou art a bloody man. Now let me ask you all, we know the Bible. Shimei, of course, didn't know the truth uh, 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 as far as he had the Bible to see the, what, the, what was all going on behind the scenes that he didn't know about. Well, let me ask you and I that know the Bible. Is any of that true about David? Now, we understand he was a bloody man as far as that he was a man of war, but what he's talking about is he was the cause of Saul's death. That he has usurped a throne that is not his. That he took it upon himself to take that throne in the absence of the rightful heirs. None of what he said is true. And if he had had half a mind to seek the Lord, he could have seen that. He could have known that. But Shimei instead chose to curse David. Instead of to bow to him and try to be a help to him in David's time of trouble. So we see two professions here. One, the right one. One, the wrong one. Now I want to bring this all together, and you might say, wow, we're already at the last point? Yes. (laughs) I want to bring this together and give us the whole picture. I want us to understand in that it, that illustrations always break down somewhere. There is no perfect illustration. Therefore, because there is no perfect illustration, they, they cannot be the interpretation of Scripture. Many, too many people, they study the Bible looking for these illustrations, these pictures, And they use that to interpret the Bible. They cannot be used to interpret. There is one interpretation, and that is a factual, grammatical, historical interpretation. But you can use these for application. Application. And there are many applications that can be made. Let me help by making one today. As we go back over all of these things, the people, the place, uh, the proposal, the profession, let us get the picture all together. Saul. The name of Saul means desired. Now, when Saul became king, he was God's man. God chose him to be the king, and he was desired by God to be the king. In this, I look at at Saul as a picture, an illustration of God. So you can see now why I say an illustration is not perfect, amen? There's a breakdown, but just stick with me, all right? Follow me here. Saul is a picture of God in this. Jonathan, the name of Jonathan means Jehovah has given. Jehovah has given. Jonathan is a picture of Adam. The one given by God onto this earth to fill this earth, to take care of this earth, to have a place of fellowship with God. Jonathan is a picture of Adam and realize 
Jonathan was a decent picture of Adam at the beginning. Adam at the beginning, remember, was created perfect. And Adam at the beginning was created to, uh, to walk with God, to fellowship with God, and, and, and was a great companion to God. But there came a time when Adam chose to do wrong. Jonathan was born in Ephraim. Remember, that is the land of double fruit. Plenty. The Bible says in Genesis 2, 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Adam was created, birthed in a place of plenty. A place of plenty. But he died. We understand why Adam died. Why did he die? Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Remember the command that God had given Adam? In the day ye eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Day or Adam, excuse me, Adam died right there. Not physically, but spiritually. Day, uh, Adam eventually died physically because of this moment right here. But he died spiritually right there immediately. There was a day when Jonathan died. I do not say it was because of bad choices necessarily, but... He died. And his death is the same reason that all men die, the same reason Adam died, the same reason we die. His death was because of sin. He died. Mephibosheth. I want us to look at Mephibosheth, and I want us to see a picture of us, each individual person here today. He was the son of Jonathan who is, again, the picture of Adam. You and I are sons and daughters of Adam. Each and every one of us, if we could just trace the lineage far enough back, we could find our way all the way back to uh, Noah, and then we would find our way back through Noah to Adam. We all come from the loins of Adam. Doesn't matter. As the old Sunday school song says, red or yellow, black or white, they are all precious in a sight. Why? Because we're all one blood. There's only one race. That's the human race. We are one blood of one creator. We all come from the loins of the same one man. We all are the son and daughters of Adam. And just like Mephibosheth, the day his father died, Mephibosheth became lame. You and I, because of the death of Adam, you and I were born lame. We were born lame. The Bible even goes further that we were born dead in our trespasses and sins. When you think of a lame man back in those days, he's good as a dead dog. That was part of his proclamation. I am lame. I can't do nothing. I need people to take care of me. I can't provide for my family. I'm like a dead dog. And each and every one of us when we were born were that dead dog. Lame because of the death of our father Adam. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 12, whereas by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. We see in Mephibosheth as well that he was again living in Lodabar, not a pasture. You and I, when we were born into this earth, we found ourselves born into a Lodabar. A place, not a pasture. Not, not the world itself, but spiritually. We were born into a load of bar. We didn't have the plenty spiritually. We didn't have a place to lay down our head spiritually. 
We didn't have a place of running streams and uh, hills and, 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 and frolicking sheep and, and a bounty of the food. We didn't have that. We were born into a place of barrenness, a place of sin called Lodabar. Remember, I said we would come back to this man, Maker. Maker, though, in reality, he was probably a good man trying to help Mephibosheth. But the name Maker means sold. And so I want us to picture today Maker as Satan. You know, each and every one of us, because of the death of our father, we were born lame. We're in a load of bar in the house of one that we've been sold to. In the house of bondage. In the house of a place where we can't get away. A house of bondage. Satan has each one of us at birth in his house of bondage. Second Peter 2.19 says, While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. You and I were born overcome of sin, overcome of Satan. The Bible even goes so far as to say we were the children of Satan. We were in bondage to that man whom we had been overcome by. But then there's David. David, a picture of Jesus in many instances in the Bible. David, known as the shepherd king, and Jesus, known as the great shepherd. He, David, was willing to condescend to those who were worthy of death to show his kindness. And so was Jesus. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Think about that for a moment once again. It's the verse we all know, the verse that's said all the time, and so sometimes maybe we just let it become kind of commonplace with us. But the verse has much more to say than the words even just by themselves. It is telling us of a man who was willing. God didn't just send him unwillingly. The Bible says he willingly placed himself under the will of the Father. This man willingly condescended, lowered himself. Here is the king, David. He is a ruling, he is reigning, and he has every right to take out anybody that would try to usurp his throne. How often, specifically when we were lost, but even as saved, have we usurped the throne of Jesus, the King of kings? And yet, he was willing to condescend, take on a robe of flesh, live the life that we live, deal with the temptations and the troubles and the trials that we deal with. Far greater, I would say, than any of us have ever known. Yet without sin. So that he could show kindness to us. If your heart's not being stirred right now, there's something wrong. And he brought us a proposition, a proposal. This proposal, come, be a child of the king. Come, sit at my table and eat of my bread. Leave Lodabar and come to Jerusalem, the city of peace. Remember Lodabar, not a pasture. Oh, the Jerusalem, specifically our spiritual Jerusalem. What a great difference. 
The Bible tells me in Psalm 23, verse 1 through 6, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why? Because there's plenty there. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Remember the restoration that David gave Mephibosheth? He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can you imagine if maybe David had already wrote this psalm? And many believe he had wrote this psalm when he was just a shepherd boy. That maybe Mephibosheth, as he sat down one night at the king's table, thinking of where he was before, where he deserved to be. And yet he found himself surrounded by the king's family. Enjoying the king's food. Can you imagine maybe this psalm came to his mind? And he got to thinking, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You know, it was one that he restored his soul. But David restored to Mephibosheth all that was his by birth. That had been taken away from him in reality by David becoming king. He gave to him everything but the kingship. He restored all the lands. He restored the servants. He restored all of it. And this reminds me of Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now there's one other person in this that I don't even have in my notes. I, I struggled with him as I studied, but as, a, as we sang today, I started thinking about him again, and God gave me a picture. And that is this man, Zeba. When Ziba comes, David asked him, Art thou Ziba? What did Ziba say? Thy servant is he. When Ziba let him know of Mephibosheth, you had to you got to know that in the back of his mind, he's got to be thinking, if he doesn't kill this man. I'm probably going to be back under the servitude of this man. But you know, that's okay for Ziba. Because Ziba says, I'm a servant. That's what I am. Thy servant is he. You know what I see in Ziba? Again, all pictures are not perfect. But I see in Ziba a picture of the Holy Ghost. When David, Jesus, says, who is there that I can show my kindness to? The Holy Ghost comes and says, there's one down there that I've been dealing with. Amen. I think he's about ready for you to show your kindness to. And Saul, or David, excuse me, sins after Ziba. The Bible doesn't tell us who. He sent to get Ziba, but I imagine in my heart, he, or to get Mephibosheth, I imagine in my heart, he sent Ziba. Go get your master's son. Go bring him here. And when he brings him, he restores not only the land that he lost, but he gives him Ziba and Ziba's heirs. 
So Ziba is a continual servant. He is continually with Mephibosheth. What a picture of the Holy Ghost. Not necessarily a servant that like, hey, Holy Ghost, do what I say. But one who, because he's the servant of David, the servant of Jesus. Remember, the Holy Spirit, though equal, he doesn't speak of himself. He lifts up Jesus. He has been given to us to be with us forever. And he will not leave. And he does the service of a servant. A service of reminding us. A service of convicting us and teaching us. Many servants were used to teach the master and to teach the master's children. Ziba, a good picture of the Holy Ghost. Another picture, uh, another present by Jesus. Another present by David. I have to ask us today, isn't it good to be saved? Isn't it good to be out of Lodabar? Isn't it good to be at the king's table? Maybe today you've never accepted the proposal. Today you can. You can leave Lodabar. And you can come to Jerusalem. And you can sit at the king's table. As one of the king's sons. And you can enjoy his mercy and his grace and his kindness forever and ever. Child of God, if you've experienced it, live in it. Don't let it die in you. Don't let it become second nature. There should be tears of rejoicing. There should be joy in your heart. There should be worship. There should be shouting of praise. Let it sink in today. Father, I thank you. so good to us we were nothing but dead dogs and you gave us a place you gave us a position you gave us back an inheritance all glory to you and to your son Jesus Christ May we lift our hands to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.